In this presentation, I will provide you a brief overview of Crevclo's Letters from an American Farmer, from which we will be reading a few excerpts. Now, we begin as our point of departure, Benjamin Franklin's autobiography. It's a mistake to assume that Franklin's autobiography is simply that, the story of one man's life. Franklin writes very self-consciously. That is, he is very much aware of certain literary conventions. He is aware that in telling his own story, he is also creating an American myth. He is aware of how his audience is likely to react, and he consciously selects those events from his life that contribute to the myth of the man of humble beginnings who rose to prominence through the use of reason in a country where hierarchies of nobility no longer existed. The same can be said for Hector Saint-Jean de Crèvecoeur, who wrote Letters from an American Farmer in 1782. In this work, too, the author is much less interested in telling his life story than he is in defining a character he calls the American Farmer, and he sets forth this character as the model of the ideal human being of the Enlightenment, free from corrupt society. Born Michel Guillaume Jean de Crèvecoeur in 1735 in Normandy, France, Crèvecoeur changed his name when he became a citizen of New York in 1765. Although French by birth, Crèvecoeur was an Anglophile. After many years of working as a surveyor, he married and settled in on a farm in central Pennsylvania. Letters from an American Farmer, as the title explains, is constructed as a series of letters from the fictional character James, as Crèvecoeur refers to himself, to Mr. F. B., an Englishman. It is the first book ever to attempt to answer the question, what is an American? If that question sounds a bit strange today, it's important to remember that until this point it was not universally thought that Americans were a distinct group, different from their European counterparts. It is this point that Crèvecoeur attempts to make in his definition. Crèvecoeur's American is an independent farmer, a person who owns his own land, feeds his family from what he grows, and lives with little interference from government or laws. Like Crèvecoeur, the American farmer is not educated. Crèvecoeur says that his father gave him no other education than the art of reading and writing. Thus, Crèvecoeur and his farmer may even be called anti-intellectual, in that they were opposed to abstractions and book learning. Quite the contrary, the farmer is educated through his intimacy with nature. And as a sidebar, it's important to note that Kravker does not acknowledge that a woman alone might be a farmer, although he does concede that many farm wives worked just as hard as their husbands. Kravker's farmer is a romantic. He finds both truth and beauty in nature, and derives his own nobility from nature itself. Kravker's romanticism is clearly revealed in his descriptions of nature, as when he listens to the sweet love tales of our robins told from tree to tree. However, nature for Crèvecoeur does not seem to include the wilderness. He notes that those who move to the edge of the wilderness and live by hunting become barbaric, like the wilderness itself, and can only be rehabilitated by taming the land, and by cutting down forests and farming, and by creating a garden out of the wilderness. This, to Crèvecoeur, is what civilizes them and makes them true Americans. Um, note the equation of wilderness, meaning unfarmed land, with barbarism. So we can infer from this what Crèvecoeur thinks of Native Americans, or non-Europeans in general. According to letters from an American farmer, the tremendous bounty of nature in America is part of the very soul of the farmer. He must labor, but his labor is amply rewarded by the land itself. The European, says Crèvecoeur, becomes an American by being received in the broad lap of our great alma mater, 
the great mother, the American landscape. In Europe, there is no real motivation for ordinary people to do their best. Whereas in America, labor is founded on the basis of nature, self-interest. A farmer who is working for himself and his family will put forth his best effort. He writes, men are like plants. The goodness and flavor of the fruit proceeds from the peculiar soil and exposition in which they grow. We are nothing but what we derive from the air we breathe, the climate we inhabit, the government we obey, the system of religion we profess, and the nature of our employment. Here you will find but few crimes. These have acquired as yet no root among us. One has to wonder what Krasko would think if he could time travel to the 21st century and see what all of this self-interest has gotten us in terms of the pollution of our environment, um, the complexity of our politics, and so forth. Freedom is another important characteristic of the American farmer. The farmer possesses, quote, freedom of action, freedom of thoughts, end quote. And the land itself, the owning of property, is the foundation of that freedom. The form of government that grew in America, where everyone is noble and hierarchy and rank do not exist, allows each individual to become what nature intended. Krevka writes, We have no princes for whom we toil, starve, and bleed. We are the most perfect society now existing in the world. Here, man is free as he ought to be, nor is this pleasing equality so transitory as many others are. He really thought of this freedom as um, a perpetual state of being. He continues, Many ages will not see the shores of our great lakes replenished with inland nations, meaning that um, this newly formed America will continue to be united, nor the unknown bounds of North America entirely peopled. Who can tell how far it extends? Who can tell the millions of men whom it will feed and contain? For no European foot has as yet traveled half the extent of this mighty continent. Here you see the germs of that ideology we encounter in the late 19th century known as manifest destiny, this idea that it is the destiny of the American people and the American government to um, take control of um, most of North America, or at least, you know, um, from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And again, of course, the problem with this is that it ignores the indigenous people who occupy this territory. Um, so this so-called empty land isn't really empty. Um, to see it as empty, you have to see the indigenous inhabitants as not really being people. Now, a sidebar. Some modern feminists have seen Klevko's language about taming the wilderness as a sexual metaphor that unmasks the romantic Klevko as an imperialist conqueror, conqueror who rapes the land. Um, I've already talked about some of the um, ways in which we can come at Klevko's work um, with uh, kind of an ethnic studies um, methodological approach in mind, right? Um, we have the benefit of hindsight and we can see the blind spots, the cultural blind spots um, that Klevko's ideology um, espouses. But it's important to read Klevko because we see in his work kind of the starting point of this ideal of the American um, some of the fundamental intrinsic qualities associated with Americanness, and really the kind of archetypal American hero. So the ideal of the American farmer has become one of the guiding myths of American democracy and a recurrent theme in American literature. Critic R. W. B. Lewis, in a book called *The American Adam*, might own 
almost be quoting from Krevko when he describes the American literary hero, whom he dubs the American Adam, as, quote, an individual emancipated from history, happily bereft of ancestry, untouched and undefiled by the usual inheritances of family and race, an individual standing alone, self-reliant and self-propelling, ready to confront whatever awaited him, with the aid of his own unique and inherent resources. So this is where we get the myth of the self-made man. Um, if you're familiar with F. F. Scott Fitzgerald's novel, The Great Gatsby, this could very well describe the Gatsby character, right? This guy who comes from out of nowhere and suddenly seems to be, you know, amazingly successful. This is kind of the origin of the myth of the American dream. So this idea of the American hero um, appears quite sincerely in the works of writers such as Ralph Waldo Emerson, Walt Whitman, and Henry David Thoreau. Um, some of these authors will encounter this term. However, many other writers believed that this ideal American never really existed at all, and that corruption comes from within the human soul, not from social structures, as Enlightenment thinkers would have us believe. So we see um, writers such as Hawthorne, um, Herman Melville, and Henry James often begin their works with characters very similar to Klefko's farmer, innocent, self-reliant, hopeful, and then trace their downfall as they find the worm in the soul of humanity, and as they confront evil, decadence, and human frailty. Um, so we have some kind of contrasting views of human nature that we're encountering, encountering here, um, but Klevka provides a nice transition from the work of Benjamin Franklin to the work of Ralph Waldo Emerson.